Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Southard, and it's my honor to uh, lead tonight's uh, lecture. This year, the McConnell Center has been exploring a wide variety of political perspectives ac across the continuum of American politics. This project, which has been called Variety Left and Right, was recently featured in Time Magazine as part of a series on overcoming toxic polarization in American public life. The center from which I graduated in 2015 reached out to people on campus and in the community to help build the most robust and diverse program they could. And I'm glad they reached out to me to help let me partner with them to bring in my friend Eric Erickson tonight to help bring this series to a conclusion. For those interested in exploring the series, videos are available on the McConnell Center's YouTube page and many of them have been made into podcasts which are found at the McConnell Center podcast and all major podcast platforms. Along with our group here tonight, let me please also welcome those watching on YouTube. Thank you for tuning in. Tonight is my distinct honor to introduce Eric Erickson. Eric is a conservative American radio host and blogger. He hosts a three-hour weekday talk show on WSB 95.5 FM and 50 AM in Atlanta, which is syndicated to other radio stations around the US. He also uh, writes for The Resurgent, and was previously the editor-in-chief and CEO of another conservative political blog called Red State. He was a political contributor for CNN from 2010 to 2013, and afterwards was a contributor to the Fox News Channel before leaving the network in 2018. Eric is becoming a titan of conservative talk radio. When the late and great Rush Limbaugh passed, National Review writer Dan McLaughlin wrote that the late emperor of talk radio created an empire too large to be left uncontested to a single heir upon his death. It's true that Rush shaped the politics of conservatism and the Republican Party more than any single figure of the 1990s, 2000s, and 2010s. In a very true sense, Rush sensed a realignment of sorts in American politics, and he understood them better than any single politician because he listened to his listeners. I truly mean this, that when I say that in the next generation of American politics, Eric Erickson will be that voice for the Republican Party. Please join me in welcoming my friend, the conscious of conservatism, Eric Erickson. Well, that was very high praise indeed. So first of all, I, I want to note that when I die and Sean, you carve a bust of me, I want a cigar sticking out of my mouth too. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. I've never seen that before. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'll give you a very brief overview of who I am uh, before I, I dive further into what's been on my mind a lot on radio and in writing. Uh, I am a native of Louisiana. In 1980, uh, my father was told he could pick one of four countries in which to move in the world for the oil company he worked. Uh, the Canary Islands, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, or Indonesia. And my dad said, uh, let's go to the Canary Islands. They said, great, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, or the United Arab Emirates. He said, okay, Indonesia. They said, great, Saudi Arabia, or the United Arab Emirates. He said, United Arab Emirates. I grew up in Dubai uh, from 1980 to 1990. We would come home during the summer to rural Louisiana. Uh, in 1990, before the Gulf War started, we moved back to the U.S. I suddenly realized that was like years before Sean was even born. And I, I grew up in Louisiana at the time of the very notorious American politician Edwin Edwards, uh, who his fifth wife, I think, is still living. I think it's his fifth wife. He served way longer than any other governor. He would be term limited out for a term and then come back regularly until he was carted off to prison for a number of years. And he was moving back to the States from Dubai, I happened to move in, was a political junkie, it was my way to connect to the United States, but came back and landed in the middle of uh, David Duke, the Klansman, versus Edwin Edwards, the governor, which saw such uh, illustrious Republican figures as President George H.W. Bush campaigning for the Democrat, Edwin Edwards. Uh, my parents, of course, my grandparents had the sticker on the back of their car that said, vote for the crook, it's important. Uh, Edward Edwards uh, was reelected against the Klansmen, and I thought, I must leave this state. And so I did. I moved to Georgia and went to undergraduate at Mercer University, stayed for law school at Mercer University's uh, law school, practiced law for a number of years, and actually wound up becoming a political consultant, running political campaigns around the country. 
and loved politics and hated law. Uh, there was this thing called a client. They had problems and I did not like dealing with them. And many times they did not like to pay their bills. So I, my friends had started Red State. They put me in charge of it. I was there. CNN came calling one year and asked if I wanted to be a CNN contributor. And I said, sure. And then the local radio show host in my town of Macon, Georgia, home of Otis Redding, Little Richard, and the Allman Brothers, uh, the local morning show guy got arrested in a crack house. And they called me from the radio station and said, have you ever done radio? No. Would you like to? I'll give it a try for a day, 6 to 9 a.m. Well, then they fired the guy, and my one day turned into three months. I got paid in an expired gift certificate to Outback Steakhouse. And as it so happened, the president of Cox Media Group, one of the large radio companies in America, was driving through Macon, heard the show, thought it was my show, and knew Herman Cain was running for president and offered me Herman Cain's job on radio. And I was very good friends with Rush Limbaugh before I was in radio. And it's like, I don't know that I have the bandwidth to do something like this. And he said, you will do it or we will never speak again. So I got into radio, uh, started nine to midnight, uh, moved to evening drive time uh, very quickly. I'm the only person, the station is now 102 years old. And I'm the only person in the last 75 years, I think, to have gotten a job who was not in radio first and only because they thought I was a radio guy. Uh, but the ratings were good, and when uh, Rush passed away, I moved noon to three nationally. Uh, that's kind of me. I, I did election law, I did corporate law. I am not an intellectual giant. People confuse me for that because I'm fat. Uh, I do talk, uh, but that's not intellect. Uh, I will tell you, though, that I have a theory about American politics that doesn't get talked about often because so many people, particularly in my generation, fixate on what happened on 9-11. Uh, I was actually practicing law on 9-11 and went into the break room of my office preparing for a deposition and saw the planes hit. And it really was a, a life-changing moment for American history. I actually think we are now in a political realignment that probably would have happened sooner but for 9-11. And it happens to do with an election Americans tend to gloss over, which turns out in my mind to be one of the fatal moments for the American conservative movement. What should have been the shining, monumental moment of victory for the GOP in turn actually turned out to be a very fearic victory for them and has caused, I think, the problems we're having right now. And that is, in 1991, the President of the United States, with 70 to 90 percent popularity, depending on who you ask, confronted a young man from Arkansas named Bill Clinton who went around the country and said, our president is a very nice man who is completely out of touch with America. No Democrat wanted to run against George H.W. Bush. The Democrats wanted a man named George um, what, Pataki from New York to run. And um, was it, no, it was Mario Cuomo they wanted to run. It was Mario Cuomo. They wanted Cuomo to run. And Cuomo looked at George H.W. Bush's poll numbers, said there's no way any Democrat can beat this guy. And Bill Clinton ran. Bill Clinton winning in 1992 was the death nail for the modern conservative movement. Why? Because in 1994, any Democrat who was at all conservative was now a Republican. And conservatives who used to have to work across the aisle to build conservative bipartisan legislation no longer had to reach across the aisle because there was no one there with whom they could do business and they lost the skill of being able to persuade over time from that other side. We got to George W. Bush in 2000, who was the first president since, uh, what, what, Quincy Adams, I guess, who won the Electoral College and did not win the popular vote, and he probably would have had a hard time winning re-election, but for three planes that crashed into America and rallied the nation around the man, and became the last Republican president elected to get 51% of the vote. Um, what was happening was a nation that was slowly beginning to divide itself back to the original fights of the American founding between the Hamiltonians and the Jeffersonians. Uh, rural versus urban divides in this country have always been the thing, but beyond class, that have shaped the country. And even now are, the suburbs tend to be the battleground for both sides. The Democrats have thought after Donald Trump they might have won the suburbs, but turns out they were just for rent to the Democrats and they're still up for grabs by both sides. 
you get to Donald Trump, and Donald Trump is not the cause of the divisions in the country. He's not really even a catalyst for the divisions of the country. He's just a symptom of the divisions of the country. And we are a country that is going through a political realignment. Every hundred years or so, the United States does. We probably would have had that political realignment in the very early 2000s with George W. Bush, but for 9-11. And we just put it on ice while we dealt with our issues abroad. A lot of my friends say it's the psychological trauma of 9-11 that caused the things we're seeing in the country right now. I don't actually think that's the case. I think that 9-11 actually put on pause those things. And if anything, it's the ice rapidly melting that has caused the greater tensions. We could not allow those things to devolve at a time when we had a president who, whether you agreed with him or not, was a nice person. Instead, we got to 2016 where we had a group of people who felt under existential threat by a group of people they no longer had to communicate with because they had conservatives had become so dominant. Now suddenly progressives are in charge with Barack Obama. And you must remember in 2004, Republicans openly talked about how the Democrats would never win a majority in the country again. Very much like the Democrats did the same thing towards 2016, there's no way the Republicans will ever win again. And you get to 2016 and guess what they do? It turns out whether you liked her or not, Hillary Clinton ran a genuinely terrible presidential campaign. Uh, you can quibble over the dynamics of Russia and Russian disinformation. The reality is Hillary Clinton for the last 100 days of her campaign never campaigned in, in Wisconsin or Michigan or Erie County, Pennsylvania and lost those areas to Donald Trump when her husband, Bill Clinton, was telling her to. I have to jump back to Bill Clinton because I actually do think a lot of our current turmoil comes from that era. Bill Clinton was not actually a fantastic politician. For himself, he was. But in 1994, Republicans, for the first time in 40 years, took back the House of Representatives. And it was with Newt Gingrich instead of Bob Michael who told Republicans that they didn't have to settle for the scraps from the appropriators' tables, they could take the tables for themselves and fight. And he began a systemic campaign within Congress to perform before cameras in ways that members of Congress had not done before to capture the imagination of the American people and galvanize them. Now, I was coming of age at this time. And in 1994, I had started the College Republicans at my alma mater and was volunteering for a man named Saxby Chambliss who had run for Congress in 1992 and lost to a Democrat. And in 1994, I was in the campaign war room that night as the results started coming in across America and answered the phone and my hero of all heroes at the time named Bill Bennett was on the other line and was telling, trying to convey that he was in a newsroom and what was coming was unheard of. And it was, it was a massive Republican wave. For those of you who were born in the 90s, which probably is almost everyone in this room, I am old now, I accept it. Um, you don't understand what it was like in the 70s, 80s, and the early 90s. The Republicans were great at winning the White House. They were pretty good at winning in legislatures, occasionally could accidentally win federal office. There were six senators elected in 1980 on Ronald Reagan's coattails who were called the accidental senators. And that's actually, if you Google accidental senators, that's those six senators. They were not expected to be elected, a, Democrat, a Republican from Florida and a Republican from Georgia. And it turns out they were harbingers of things that would come. And they got elected and six years later, almost all of them were gone. Uh, one committed suicide, the other five were thrown out of office. And so um, one of them bounced back in later. And what was just remarkable about this period of time was even Republicans psychologically did not actually believe in 1994 that they could actually take the majority. I was working in campaigns at the time, and I assure you the public confidence was betrayed by the private whispers that we haven't done this in 40 years, it's probably not going to happen. And overnight it happened. And it happened because of a man named Bill Clinton. Southern Democrats at the time still viewed themselves as religious, moral people. They saw the problems of Bill Clinton, not necessarily his personal life, but the people with whom he was putting into positions of government who were, for the time, radically progressive. 
in ways that now will seem genuinely moderate, they weren't at the time, particularly for Southern and Midwestern voters. And those voters, a switch flipped in 1994, and what had begun to happen at the federal level in 1994, 96, 98, 2000, 2002, began the switch of Southern states across the board. Me in Georgia, people think Georgia is such a Republican state, the Republicans did not fully grasp the entire state legislature in Georgia until 2006. It began in 2002, Sonny Perdue, the first Republican elected in the state since Reconstruction. He had, was able to get the state Senate, was able to pull more and more Republicans his way. Uh, and by 2006 to take it over, we began to see this. I mean, even, even the situation in Kentucky in just the last few years with Republicans finally getting to a level of dominance where voters historically, to some degree, as we've seen with black voters over time, his, for legitimate historic reasons vote Democrat, a lot of Southern whites, for legitimate historic reasons in their mind, whether they are or not, voted Democrat. And over time, because of morals, because of urban-rural divides, because of taxes, because of politicians, because of a lot of reasons, they decided that they were going to start voting Republican. Um, Democrats like to say it was the Southern strategy of Ronald Reagan, and it was Richard Nixon, and it was racism, uh, and people forget how long Democrats stayed in power in the South until the early 2000s. 9-11 uh, happened, and we just kind of paused as a nation for a little while. We had a war to fight. We had bad guys to kill. We had to mourn the dead. And then after, after 2004, the realignment forces in the country began to start moving again. We hit Barack Obama, where a lot of Southern white voters in suburbs decided they were okay voting for the first black president of the United States. They liked what he had to say. They wanted a fresh face. Now, there's a second step in the process I haven't gotten to, and it's this. Historically in the Republican Party, the party, after a president serves eight years, has a referendum internally on that president. And they do so by deciding in the next primary to pick or not pick that guy's vice president. In 2008, Dick Cheney didn't run. So what did the Republicans have to do? They had to reopen all of the wounds that George Bush had healed with John McCain in 2000 and refight those wounds internally and settle on John McCain, who then lost. And then you get to 2012, Mitt Romney ran as the conservative in 2008 to McCain being the moderate, and in 2012, Mitt Romney ran as the more moderate to the conservatives. And if you go to the polling in 2012, literally every single Republican candidate who ran dominated Mitt Romney in the polls until running out of energy. And Mitt Romney just had the money to outlast them, which fostered a level of resentment among conservatives. That conservative resentment building the whole time because they never had the chance to retaliate to George W. Bush's betrayals on Harriet Myers and immigration and the other reforms he pushed because they never got the opportunity to have the referendum on George W. Bush's presidency internally within the Republican Party. So you have all this stuff building together. You have a Republican Party that no longer has to reach out to the Democrats because the Republicans now have all of those Democrats. And you have the Republicans internally split between the Bush wing of the party and the non-Bush wing of the party, not able to have a referendum on George Bush because Dick Cheney doesn't run. It takes until 2016 when the most heavily funded Republican candidate steps forward with hundreds of millions of dollars and two massive super PACs and the last name of Bush. And he crashes and burns with the Republican Party saying, we're ready to move on from you. But it didn't stop there. They decided they didn't like anybody in leadership, including, forgive me, someone whose name is very near and dear to this facility. The rural Republicans across the nation decided they didn't like anyone who appeared to be anything related to the establishment Republican Party, and they just started striking matches. Unfortunately for the Republicans, here in 2023, 2024, uh, there are still pyromaniacs in the party who just still want to burn the vestiges of the Republican Party and leave nothing uh, they want to do to the GOP what Rome did to Carthage. And there are some who are like, guys, we've had the wildfire. It's time to pour some water and start rebuilding. We're in this never-ending rebuilding cycle like the Cubs for many years. And the party has to decide. 
while that's happening internally in the party, what's going on with the nation? We have more and more over the last 20 years, a society that actually has, contrary to American history, become really immobile. You go somewhere where you go to college, you're probably gonna stay there. I moved to Georgia from Louisiana, went to college in middle Georgia and stayed. I met my wife who had no interest in moving to Louisiana. I stayed in middle Georgia. Normally, if this wasn't live streamed, I would say my wife didn't want to move to Louisiana because that's where my mother is, but I wouldn't say that on the live stream because my mom might see, I love you, mom, if you watch. <laughs> it's a long time joke that, that I say that we'll just leave it there. Um, and we see people in the urban areas of the country stay in urban areas. As a result, we see people in rural parts of the country stay in rural areas. The difference is that people who live in urban areas no longer have to commute to work, and increasingly people in rural areas do. So people in rural areas of the America are still more likely to interact with people who don't share their values, and increasingly people in urban enclaves in the country become much more isolated because they don't have to interact with people in rural America anymore in a way that someone who commutes an hour to work, which is a norm in large parts of this country, does. So you have an insularity within a progressive system of beliefs within urban areas. You have a growing insularity among people in rural areas with one difference, they interact more with progressives than the other way around. And at the same time, these rural parts of the country feel increasingly threatened by urban parts of the country. They feel this great divide. Those rural parts of the country also tend to be Republican, but also tend to be Republicans who've just set the party on fire because there were too many of the urban suburban Republicans in charge who didn't seem to care for them. So we have now, what we had at the beginning of the 1900s, uh, parts of the 1800s, we have a great shakeup of the parties, where if you are an urban or suburban, highly educated white person, in the early 1900s, you would be Episcopalian and call the Republican Party at prayer. And now you're called members of the Democratic Party and may still be Episcopalian. If you're in rural America and you're black, Hispanic, or white, you're more and more likely to vote for conservative candidates. In fact, in rural parts of the country, you will find many black Democrats whose positions are equal to the Republicans and will at the state level, in the privacy of the ballot box, vote more and more at the state level for Republicans. We have increasingly white people in the suburbs who are deeply scared of the pyromaniacs of the Republican Party who seem unable to stop burning things down, who are ideologically not aligned with much of the Democratic Party, but realize the Democrats aren't striking matches burning everything down. They're spooked because the one thing that people in suburban areas of this country care about more than anything else is a 401k. And the people who aren't burning down America are more likely to preserve your 401k than the people burning everything down. It's a money proposition for suburbia. Suburbia doesn't particularly care for the cultural values of the left. Uh, middle class mothers who want their children to do well and get scholarships push their daughters into sports and actually are turned off by the transgender issue because they believe their daughters are gonna be competing against uh, boys who identify as girls in sports. But they're perfectly willing to allow those cultural issues to play out while they vote for someone who's not going to destroy their family's 401k. Because in this country, intergenerational wealth still matters a great deal to everyone. It is increasingly mattering to non-white voters in this country who see the insularity at the upper levels of the Democratic Party due to the realignment that's happening as isolating them from advantage. The Republican Party used to be the party of big business it's not a coincidence that the Democratic Party now represents the wealthiest districts in the country and the Republicans the poorest districts in the country. Our dynamics of everything in the past hundred years have begun to turn on their head. It's a natural process. What's not natural is that we are witnessing this for the first time with 24-7 news, social media, Facebook messages, the internet, and a vast media that we did not have at the turn of the 1900s when we were having uh, political realignments in the country. We're living through something that would seem similar, I think, to people in politics 100 years ago, but we're giving it language that they couldn't give it because we are developing new idiomatic expressions in insularity from each other, where conservatives and progressives can now talk to each other in ways separated from each other in ways that didn't exist 100 years ago. 
which makes the country seem even more divided than it actually is. And that amplification of division is fostered in the television coverage where conservatives watch Fox, liberals watch MSNBC, uh, an increasing number of Americans watch CNN. People want their views affirmed. They don't actually want information anymore because they're getting their information not from the news media, but from their friends on social media. People are more and more likely to find information from their friends. Now, guess what happens? You and I are arranged in something called a community. And that community is based on whoever comes. But online, our community is based on who we choose to pair with. And the online community increasingly looks and thinks exactly like us. A hundred years ago, when we had political realignment, we didn't have a social media force where you and I could create our own community. And one of the things I spent a lot of time talking to my radio audience about is that whoever is your friend on Facebook is not coming to take care of you when you're sick and is not coming to water your plants when you're out of town and is not coming to feed the cat when you're on vacation. It's the actual person next door. And for the first time in American history, more Americans are less likely to know the name of the person next door to them than 100 years ago. We've isolated ourselves into communities of interest at a moment the politics of the country are realigning, which causes the realignment to not just be sharper, but the divides to be bigger, which allow people like Michael Anton to write a Flight 93 election essay where he thinks there's an existential threat to the country and we have to either crash a plane or be, take charge of the plane, let the plane nosedive, uh, kill off everybody on the plane to save the, save the country or some such, grappling for analogies. We see uh, Rui Teera's piece on Hispanic voters moving more and more to the GOP because as the Democrats in the insularity of their communities have become more likely to embrace ideas like intersectionality, Hispanic voters moving into this country, believe it or not, don't consider themselves Hispanic voters. They consider themselves Americans first, but then they consider themselves Mexicans, Guatemalans, Hondurans, Nicaraguans, Venezuelans, Cubans. They don't see themselves in the ideological identity politics that the left does. So the left's voice for identity politics, which was meant to identify and elevate minority voices, divides immigrant minority voices who don't identify as a class. They identify from a nation and an ethnicity uh, that is now American. And so that draws them to the GOP. We see younger black men moving towards the GOP in a way that older black citizens aren't for a lot of very legitimate historic reasons uh, for black Americans. But younger black men, it wasn't really about Donald Trump. When they're polled, they see an economic argument from the GOP. And all of these issues cascade and careen at a time where Americans don't have an attention span to really give voice or thought to the policies and processes by which to get through this political realignment which is why now we have on both the Republican and the Democratic side at the extremes, people who believe the country's at a tipping point, and if they can be in charge of tipping the country over, they can rebuild in their own image on the far left and the far right. That's not actually gonna happen. I think those are probably the most isolated people in the country who have developed a community solely of people of their own interest. When I talk to people about these issues, and trace it back to Bill Clinton and the conservative movements need no longer to make a persuasive case to people who are in the other party. A lot of people ask, well, what do you do about these sorts of things? How do you, how do you shift the paradigm? And I am an evangelical Christian. I'm actually in seminary right now. I was working on my PhD, but decided remote study in me is not good right now. So I had to move back into the structure of a classroom to finish my MDiv. Uh, I am a very big advocate of Jeremiah 29. Um, the book of Jeremiah is, the prophet Jeremiah is writing to the Jews in exile. The prophet Daniel is reading from this letter. When you read the book of Daniel, it talks about Daniel reading this. And Jeremiah delivers his message from God. And it's a message I actually think is probably more timely for our civilization right now than at any point since then, and it is to seek the welfare of the community in which you live and pray for it because there you'll find your welfare. Settle down, plant a garden, build a house, take a family, and build community in your community. And what he meant by that was you can't be so focused on the politics of Washington, D.C., as our news media makes us, that you don't focus on the politics of your hometown. If you don't know where the battered women's shelter is in your hometown so that you can volunteer, 
uh, but you know exactly where the think tank in Washington, D.C. is, you are part of the problem. If you don't know where the food bank is in your hometown, but you know where to write a check in Washington, D.C. to advance your favorite politician, you actually are part of the problem because you have decided that your community of interest is Washington, D.C. and not your local community. And ideally, if all of us took this idea seriously, we would, at disparate parts and completely removed from each other in political ideas, be working for common interests in our community, as others are in their community, which would ultimately spill over for the betterment of everyone. For progressives who think they're under existential threat from a neo-Christian fascist right, and Christians who think they're under threat from a progressive fascist authoritarian left, if you actually get together in your local town, you'll find, as I did when I was an elected city councilman, there really, I promise you, is no partisan position on trash collection other than pick the crap up. There really isn't. You will find common ground with people with whom you completely disagree on local issues. Everyone wants their street paved. Everyone wants their child to get a good education, even as they may disagree on what it looks like and how to implement it. Everyone wants to be safe and everyone wants the trash picked up. Everyone wants the water to be clean in their hometown. And if Americans got back to that Jeffersonian local rural model of everyone in the community involved together, we would actually allow the Hamiltonian model to thrive as well. Business in America would thrive well if we were all Jeffersonians in our local community so that we could be Hamiltonians abroad. This political realignment is unsettling for people like me particularly because I'm in a ratings-based business. And in a ratings-based business, you don't want to piss off your audience so much that they all flee. I have a very good habit of pissing off my audience. Uh, in 2016, I did not support Donald Trump for president. I didn't support Hillary Clinton either. Um, I, I was asked in an interview on Fox News uh, if I was forced to pick between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, what would I pick? And I said the bullet. Um, <laughs> was not a fan of either one. And I maintained that position. Um, my children were bullied and beat up at school because of it. We had uh, people show up at our house to threaten us. Uh, I had people try to fire me. We had to have armed guards at our house for three months. Uh, my wife has an incurable form of lung cancer. When she announced this to her Bible study at church, she had a woman tell her that she would pray for her but wanted to punch her husband. Uh, those were the politics of 2016. And to a degree, they've gotten better uh, and to a degree they've gotten worse. And it is the worsening of the politics that I have found comes from the insularity of people from their community. When you believe the people in your community are out to get you because you're not involved in your community, it becomes easy to hate your community. It becomes easy for progressives to hate conservatives because they never see conservatives standing next to them feeding the homeless at food bank. It becomes really easy for conservatives to hate liberals because the conservatives never see the liberals uh, joining them in community celebrations that they find that are civically oriented. It becomes easy for both sides to separate from themselves. And within conservatism and progressivism, it's not an either or, it becomes very easy for progressives to hate other progressives who do not feel like they are engaged with as much zeal. It becomes easy for conservatives to hate conservatives for not engaging with as much zeal. It's one thing to like Donald Trump, but by God, if you don't have the bumper sticker on your car and the sign in your yard, are you really authentically Donald Trump? It's one thing for you to advance a progressive cause, but if you're not going to the protest and burning Donald Trump in effigy, are you really committed to the cause? We as a nation of individuals have become collectivists on both sides in terms of performance within politics. The way to get back to it again is to stop worrying about what happens in Washington, D.C., I will end on my most provocative note for which I get the most hate mail whenever I say it on radio, and it's true. Believe it or not, with very few exceptions, your life is no different today under Joe Biden than it was under George W. Bush in the two, early 2000s. Washington rarely gets anything done. Was Barack Obama able to advance health care? Yes, he was. And in the process, he couldn't advance immigration reform or gun control or anything else, and Republicans were able to roll much of it back. When Donald Trump was president, he governed mostly by executive order because he couldn't get things through the Senate, and Joe Biden rolled them back. The next Republican president will roll back those executive orders. 
Meanwhile, you have a local city council that will raise your property taxes. You have a local school board that will raise your property taxes. You have a local government that will fill in your potholes and deliver or not deliver uh, your trash away from your home to a garbage dump. We'll impose fees on whether or not you recycle. We'll keep you safe or not. Your local government will have more impact on your life than anything any bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. will do. When I say that on radio, conservatives rail on me of, didn't you know X, Y, and Z from the Department of Justice or the Department of Education or what they're doing to our kids? And I'll remind them, the Depart Federal Department of Education is nothing more than a loan transfer portal for student loans and sends money to the states without doing very much. You have something called an elected local school board where if you are unhappy, you can go get those people unelected by finding new people or show up and speak. The thing that I find most fascinating, I was a local elected official. It is the worst job I ever had. Part-time city council work is the nastiest version of politics because all politics is local and they will yell at you if their trash does not get picked up. I had some guy one time in my local grocery store yell at me because he did not roll his trash down in time and thought it was my duty to drive a trash truck to pick up the trash. He was too damn lazy to roll down to the road. Nasty local politics is awful. I hated every minute of it, but I learned a lot. One of the things I learned as a Republican conservative on a 15 person city council where I was one of only two Republicans was that sometimes you need after school programs that I wanted to defund because you'd be amazed when crime goes down when you have after school programs in certain parts of the community. What I also learned is that sometimes cities use themselves as an employment service for friends and family and they get very mad at you when you try to downsize city government, but it's also necessary. One of the other things I learned is that there are way more progressives in this country who know how to show up at a local city council and make a three minute speech than there are conservatives. You never ever see conservatives at a local city council or a school board meeting except in the last several years as school board issues have become contentious. I would encourage conservatives to show up all the time and make yourself be seen and heard and feel seen and heard and feel validated. And I would also encourage progressives to make a concerted effort to find ways to have common language these days with conservatives on topics that aren't political. As my last theory of the night I'll dazzle you with is I think in this realignment, one of the things that has happened with rich white voters becoming more Democrat is it corresponds to a level of secularism. As black and Hispanic voters move more to the right, it corresponds with a level of church attendance. Some political philosophers will say the greatest indicator of how you vote now is a college degree. I would say yes, but also how often you go to church. The more you go to church these days, regardless of race, the more you vote Republican. The less you go to church these days, the more you vote Democrat. And it's not a coincidence, the less you go to church these days, the more likely you are to have an advanced degree. We in this country used to have a common tongue around religious idiomatic expressions, whether it was parting the sea or crossing the Jordan. We further and further don't have those common tongues anymore as we've divided as a nation. I would tell progressives that as you have substituted faith in a divine for faith in government getting things done to build a heaven on earth you don't think will come later, you have lost the ability to reach out to and find common ground with people who don't share your politics. And that if you can find common meaningful ground with conservatives outside of politics, you can realize we're not all as bad as we, we sometimes seem on TV. And I would tell conservatives that if you can't show up and be seen serving your local community where a lot of social justice focused progressive churches are that you want nothing to do with because you don't think they're preaching the, the authentic gospel, you're not doing the authentic gospel of taking care of the poor as Christ commanded. And if you find each other in those communities of interest, you may stop realizing how much you hate each other and may realize there's a homeless man down the street who doesn't care how bad you hate each other. He would just like a full stomach so he can find a job and move on with his life. I would just conclude with this. As I said, we did not have 24 seven social media or nonstop news channels in the early 1900s when we last went through a profound political disruption in this country and a profound political realignment. We do now, and the secret to our future success will be how much we can unplug from this and from that and actually look at each other and have a conversation. And those are oftentimes not easy, not because we don't know how to communicate anymore, 
it's because we don't know how to begin the conversations with people who disagree with us and we don't know how to begin the conversations with people who disagree with us because we are no longer in the same room community town or civic engagement as the people who disagree with us and if we would remember the homeless man down the street actually yes you're supposed to love your neighbor and he's your neighbor and so many people get wrong the story of Cain and Abel it was Cain who said am I my brother's keeper God says you damn right you are and we are so we should be Thank you.